Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Liberty coming to you from the Metro East Community Media Studios. And we have three special guests tonight on our Native Nations program. But before we continue, I just want to say welcome to 2018, and I hope you have a great year, everybody. We've got some timely subjects we want to bring to you tonight, especially regarding Measure 101, which is a critical election a vote that we have to do next week. So we have Will Miller here from the Native American Youth and Family Center to talk about that later. But we also have two special guests here, Raleigh Morrison and Blanchette Morrison. And but first we're going to feature Raleigh because he has to go to work soon. And Raleigh is here to represent the uh, Union Carpenters. And Raleigh, I want you to tell us about that special program for Native Americans in carpentry. Uh, I started out in construction um, about three years ago. I um, got involved with a program called Constructing Hope. It's located on Martin Luther King and Church in Northeast Portland. And it's an $8,500 program that you can get a scholarship for and basically get the programming for free. It's an eight-week program. You don't get paid for it but they will give you all your licenses, your forklift license, your OSHA 10, your, wow. your scissor lift license. They'll give you $500 worth of brand new tools, your boots, wow. and as an incentive to having perfect attendance and showing up on time from seven in the morning till five o'clock at night, you will get direct entry into the union. Wow. And it's a program that gave me my start as well as both my sons. Both my sons are union carpenters now. We. Um, one of my sons, we're actually on a site together in downtown Portland. We we're doing Great. a seismic upgrade to a 10-story building uh, with Pence Kelly. But Constructing Hope um, affords a lot of opportunities to natives because there's the opportunity for them to get direct entry into the union of their choice. I mean, they don't have to be carpenters. They can be plumbers, pile drivers, electricians, laborers. I mean, there's a lot of avenues that can get them going, you know, because it, right now the economy as it is, is, is struggling really hard. But with the construction industry right now, it's booming. I mean, we have a lot of work to do. Oh. We are working like nonstop. I got to be um, at work at 2.30 in the morning just to pour some concrete. But um, as far as the affordable wage goes, it is an excellent opportunity because they're going to start out at 20 plus dollars an hour. And, nice. you know, depending on their trade, um, they can max out at $40, $50 an hour. That's, you know, $100,000 a year. That's a living wage. It's a living wage. And, and yeah. they'll get the skills and they'll get the opportunities to advance, you know. And sure. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity. So how, if, if I was a Native American wanting to go into carpentry, well, I'm a Native American, but <laughs> if I wanted to go into carpentry, what would I do to get into this program, Raleigh? Well, the first thing you want to do is get a hold of Bowley. And that is, uh, I'm pretty sure you're... Uh, yeah, I can't think of what it stands for, though. Yeah, I'm not quite sure either, Bureau but there's a web... Bureau of Labor and Industries. Bureau of Labor and Industries. But go on their website, and then there's a... If you um, go down to Carpenters, there will be a link for specifically for Carpentries, and then it'll, it'll um, get you hooked up with the Native side and how they yeah. can interview for it and get direct entry into the, their Carpentry. Because that, I mean, the, the short is... Is so high right now of, of qualified carpenters. I was watching a program and they, uh, the boss on site, he said, I need 75 union carpenters on site today. I mean, wow. it's that bad. We are 700 carpenters short of, you know, being able to get everything done because right now, as with the nation, um, seismic upgrade is a big thing for everybody because sure. they're saying that the, the biggest thing that's going to happen is another earthquake. So, you know, and the seismic upgrade isn't going to guarantee the building not come down. The seismic upgrade is simply going to give you time to get out of the building before it comes down. But we maybe just, reduce your insurance costs. <laughs> right. That's it. Yeah. You know, and it's it's a lot of work and there's no sugar coating it. I mean, like I said, I have to be up at two thirty in the morning in the pouring rain, pouring concrete and and busting my butt all day long. But, you know, at the end of the week, you know, I do get a, a very healthy check. Um right now I'm not a full journeyman. I haven't reached um the epitome of the top of my wage yet. I'm seven term carpenter apprentice and I'm making thirty three twenty three an hour. 
Nice. Every hour, and my overtime is forty-eight thirty-five an hour. And and if I work Saturdays, mandatory overtime. If I work Sundays, mandatory double time. It's just so. It's, no wonder you're retired, Blanchett. You got <laughs> money bags here. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm enjoy. really glad to hear that it's that good a pay and uh, for the starting wage, especially at over twenty dollars an hour. I can think of somebody in particular who I'd like to lead into this program. Excellent. But you said you get the tuition costs are covered. Everything's covered. All but you have to do living is expenses. Oh yeah, you that's have to have yeah, your yeah, own you, living expense yeah, pay for no, that. There's no. Um, you don't get paid to go. But uh, but you get the free tuition. You your scholarship. Your tuition, yes, on and that. then as part of your apprenticeship, you're afforded the opportunity to go to college. I mean, all my classes, we have our own college on 158th. And Sandy is called Pacific Northwest Carpenters Institute. And so you're going to be learning about stick fr uh, framing and drywall and welding and math. And I mean, there's a, a slew of classes that you're mandated to take. And you don't get paid to go to school, but you can collect unemployment. But um, all your classes are accredited through Mount Hood Community College. And right now we're in the process of making it so mm -hmm. when you finish your apprenticeship you will have your associate's degree all your credits are all wrapped up in one and great yeah that sounds like a great program yeah Molly. so i'm a seven term carpenter apprentice and there's eight terms so and you go you advance two terms a year so i have to go to school twice a year for 40 hours and but the, the rest of the time i'm working mm -hmm. and there's a lot of work to be done so you get a degree out of this program as well Besides all the practical knowledge, and and you can pick, you don't have to be a carpenter. Could you be like equipment operator or something? Yes, they have training yep, heavy in that. green operator. You can be truck driving. Do they have that? No, I don't think that's no. one of the trades. It's basically construction. It just mm -hmm. boils down to plumbers, electricians, laborers, yeah, uh, mill rights. I mean, there's just a slew of stuff that you can really get. It just basically comes down to what you feel comfortable in, you mm -hmm. know. And it's it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. It's a challenge. Yeah. Well, I worked retail for 12 years, and I was making $15 an hour after 12 years. Mm -hmm. And my first job as a union carpenter, I was making twenty three thirty five. That's just, you know, that's just a starting wage, and it just advances from there. It's just um, a motivation, you know, to take care of my family. I mean, I have full medical, full dental, full vision for me, my wife, my kids. Everybody's covered. You know, Great. yeah, they have all their benefits covered, life insurance and everything is all in yeah. my, it's my package. Even though I'm making thirty three twenty three, my package is worth $60 mm -hmm. an hour. So yeah. it's, it's all tied into my pension. And, and So they pay for your insurance? Yes, yes, they oh. pay for my insurance. And Very good. Um, another um, benefit of being in the union is that after five years, I'll have a pension for the rest of my life. And the longer I'm in the union, the bigger my pension will be. And my sons, one's 23 and the other one's 28, they started young. I'm 51, I started late, but you know, they, they have the opportunity to retire as millionaires when they're you know, 50 some years old. All they have yeah. to do is, it's basically called 80 and out. Basically years of service with your age, if it equals 80, you're out. So oh. they put in you know, time, they're done. Yeah. Good program, Raleigh. It and is. what was the name of the college again? Obstacles too. They accommodate for things that, um, like if you have um, a record or something like that, then they'll they'll work with you. They actually um, constructing hope. The program he went through, they actually go into the jail systems to advise people about it. Oh. And they also go to NEA. Mm. And when they go to NEA, they they work with recruiting for some of the youth to come in to oh. their program. It's incredible. Good. Yeah. Yeah, Raleigh. Uh, and what was the name of the college again? The college is on 158, um, one block north of Sandy. It's called Pacific Northwest Carpenters Institute. Pacific Northwest Carpenters Institute. Yeah, it's its own entity. It is not like a, a, a school per se, like something where somebody can just go, I want to go to school there. No, you have to be a carpenter. You have to be a union carpenter to get in to that school. And we have a big shop and we do all of our welding there. and. We do. Uh, we have classes, computers, and blueprint reading. I mean, they they throw a lot of information at you in 40 hours. And in the 14 classes I've taken, I've uh, 13 A's and one B. 
B was mad, but <laughs> it struggled yeah, a little bit. But I can understand mm -hmm. that. I yeah. didn't like math either. Yeah, but Constructing Hope, they did give me my start, and they do work with a lot of minorities. I mean, if you have a criminal background, they'll real work with you. I mean, basically, my employer has, he, he can give a less about my past. All he cares about, am I going to show up to work a half hour early? Am I going to work as hard as I can? Can I follow directions? Am I physically strong enough to do the task at hand? And there's a lot of people who say I can't get a job because of my criminal background. I can't get a job because I don't have a driver's license. We're constructing hope. They'll get you that opportunity. They'll send you through a program called Operation Clean Slate. And mm -hmm. basically, they'll clean up your driving. You owe $5,000 worth of tickets. They'll pay the $5,000 worth of tickets. They'll get you going. They, nice. They're just knocking down barriers to get minorities into the to the workforce. Right. But Constructing Hope isn't strictly minorities. There's a lot of Caucasians that go through the program. And, and so a lot of women, I mean, there's a lot of women, demand for women to be in a trade because... With the union, you have to have a certain criteria of minorities on site. It is a federal law where you need to have a certain minority population on sure. site at all times. So yeah, it has to reflect the local minority population. Right, right. So that is another benefit of getting into this trade, you know. And it, it isn't all back breaking work. There's, you know, you can be an electrician and basically you're just rewiring the building. You know, once mm -hmm. you once you get into it, I just chose carpentry, um, you know, simply because Jesus was a carpenter. I mean, that's a good I, enough I, reason. I graduated yeah. from the program and I didn't know what I wanted to be. I didn't know if I wanted to be a plumber, electrician, a, pl a laborer, or you know, a millwright, a pile driver, I had no idea what I wanted to be, and it just came to me, well, Jesus was a carpenter, I'll be a carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, Raleigh, uh, the um, Constructing Hope, do they have a web presence, a website? Or? It's, it's, it's yeah. simply constructinghope.com. Um, yeah, you search com. on it, you yeah, find it. Dot org. org, and it'll dot come org, up. Yeah. It is the only one. You know, and it's operated by a director named Pat Daniels. She's a, a wonderful lady, and yeah. she's really patient. And um, okay. I actually went and talked to the benefactors to try to get them, you know, money to raise because it's nonprofit. There's they, they don't get money from the government or anything, but they were just awarded a three hundred thousand dollar grant. I mean, wow. and if you look at that on a larger scale, scale, there's a lot of people that's going to be able to benefit from that. They're going to expand their mm -hmm. program. They're going to make their building bigger. You know, they're going to be able to hire in people and, and, and get the thing really going. You know, they right. started, you know, just in a little tiny place in Northeast Portland. And, and yeah. next thing you know, they have a lot of contractors. I believe Hoffman is one of them. There's a lot of Bowley as part of their program. There's a lot of programs who contributed to helping that program stay alive because it, it almost got to a point where they had to shut it down because there was no money coming in. But mm -hmm. to, to be able to get a $300,000 grant is, is huge for yeah. that program. Yeah. Well, it's, I think it probably reflects the great need that they have in the community mm -hmm. for more skilled labor. Right. Because if you got a shortage, nothing gets built. Right. Well, some gets yeah. built. Yeah. The only commitment they ask for me is to basically be available and, and keep in contact with them. Let me let them know where I'm working, you know, what's my wage and, you know, how am I doing? They really okay. care about how am I doing. Their, yeah, yeah. Right. Can go through the program, they say, just give follow us two, up. Yeah, give us two years of your time after you graduate and let us know what's going on. But to me, it's a lifetime commitment. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I am so grateful to that program and, yeah. you know, and I am starting I to see, understand. you know, a lot of natives come on site. I'm starting to see a lot more mini minorities come on site and I'll, right. I'll talk to them. I'm like, you know, how'd you get into the trade? <laughs> Oh, you probably haven't heard of it, a program called Constructing Hope, really. <laughs> you know, I just sit there and let them talk about it, you know, them not knowing that, you yeah. know, that's where I got my start. And yeah. both my sons, both my sons graduated from Constructing Hope, and both of them are doing really, really well right now. Good for them. And you get, you guys have more than just two sons, right? Yeah. Yeah, we Several, have yeah, we have, <laughs> many. yeah, we have six girls and two boys. Six girls, two and they're boys. all grown. We have identical twins that are seventeen and they're they're on par to graduate from high school. Mm -hmm. And one of them, she's um the youngest is actually looking into getting into the trade. So I'm gonna direct her and do what I can. As with all of our kids, you know, we encourage them to you know, pursue your dream, and if a job is a job is a job. If you need a job, get a job. If you want a career, 
you know, it's what what I have right now is a career to me. I don't. It's not a job. It's a career. Mm-hmm. Something I can fall back on. If anything goes wrong, then mm-hmm. you know, I, I'll do whatever I can to steer you in that way. But all of our kids are, you know, very articulate and very smart, and you know, they're all making their way. All of our kids are out the house now. Great. Well, way to go, mom and dad. Our oldest son told our youngest daughter. He said, "If you go through it, you know, go in for the career." but stay for the education. Mm-hmm. He said, why, why would you go and pay, you know, and get all of these bills, you know, all of these debts for your education when you can go into the carpenters union, get mm-hmm. your education, and you decide where you want to go at that point. Another nice thing about um, being in the trades is that you're not committed to being a carpenter for the rest of your life. I mean, basically, you get in, you give them five years as a carpenter, you get your pension, and all of a sudden, you wake up. It's like, you know what? I want to be a plumber. Now, all you do is simply you join the plumbers. Now you're a plumber and a carpenter. After five years, ten years, you mm-hmm. have two two um, trades underneath your belt, and you can walk on any job site and say, you know, do you need carpenters? No. Do you need plumbers? Yes, we need plumbers. I'm a plumber. You have both certificates underneath your belt. I'm a journeyman. I can go anywhere in America mm-hmm. with my card and s- show up on site. When I get there, you have to pay me this wage. This is my set wage. You know, you can't, you can't lower me. You know, and a I'm lot a journeyman of, too. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a journeyman drill rig operator. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I used to poke holes in the ground. Right. Like this big. Yeah. Taking rock samples. Yeah, I just. And huh. then I did well drilling and all kinds of different drilling yeah. methods. That's but, funny uh, you should say that. I just left class at Pacific Northwest Carpenters Institute, 40 hours of welding training. I've never done welding in my life. And today yeah, I, I, was, I was, yeah, I was doing arc welding. Have. Yeah, I was doing arc welding. I was doing wire welding. I used a... Uh, Did you get oxyacetylene yes, cutting used, torch? Yeah, I actually, good. yeah, I cut, out, I cut out some... Um, some metal, you know, yeah. I, I did one T. That's something you can fall back on is yeah. weldings. And they Good offer certificate, certifications. You know, you can get your certs through um, PNCI. You're, you, you can go to classes and they will give you everything you need. They will test you to the highest standards. So everything you have, you can go on site and say, I'm a welder. You know, and that's part, I'm a carpenter. But I'm also a welder. I'm certified as a welder, and that mm-hmm. is a high demand right now. There's hardly mm-hmm. any welders. With all the bridge work going on right now, Oregon is really, really short on on welders right mm-hmm. now. And I, I personally, in this 40 mm-hmm. hours of my life, I just did. I loved it. I love. Yeah, welding. I would recommend welding. It's a great mm-hmm. skill to have. Yeah. And I learned how to do a cording torch and then arc welding. Yeah. So after you cut it up, you weld it back together. Yeah. And uh, it's. It was fun. Yeah. And you can create, and it's challenging. So, Raleigh, I know you've got to go to work at 2.30 tomorrow morning. A.M., <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you better get home and yeah. get to bed. Yeah. And uh, thanks a lot for coming. Oh, I appreciate it. Telling us all about the program. <coughs> and nice to nice All right. It was a lot, more, a lot more than we expected. So yeah. good job Thank getting the information so out. Thank, Thank you. you. So we're sorry to see Raleigh has to go get some sleep. But we have Will Miller here yep. to bring to talk about a very timely topic. And Measure 101, which we have to have our ballots in by next week. Yep. We also you brought a little commercial. I did, a Tell clip. Tell us about that clip. Yeah, Will. so what the clip um, really outlines uh, the, the significance of why Measure 101 is important and why folks should uh, cast their ballots by Tuesday. So ballots are due on Tuesday by 8 p.m. Um, at your your local library or elections office. And um, it's really important for our community to, to turn out to vote um, and, and be heard. And so this clip really kind of outlines the significance of what Measure 101 does and um, the implications of, of uh, what it means. All right. Yeah. Well, if you've got it up and ready in the old booth, there it is. Let- when a family finds out that their child is sick, it will have an enormous impact on their lives. When people don't have insurance, families declare bankruptcy, take out loans or get a second mortgage when they're trying to concentrate on their sick child. 
Measure 101 ensures that hundreds of thousands of Oregonians, including all Oregon children, will be able to maintain their health coverage and receive care when they need it. Being a nurse, you do have the opportunity to give someone in crisis some hope. Our job is to provide high quality care. I want to live in a state where everybody can receive the health care that they need. And that's why 101 is so important. Protect health care for Oregon families. Join your neighbors in voting yes on Measure 101. Hey, we're back. back. So tell us about that clip, Will. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give an overview of what Measure 101 is. Oh, and, please. And kind of provide folks with um, details as to the implications of a, a pass or fail. Um, so Measure 101 is uh, essentially a 1.5% fee on hospitals and health insurance companies that goes to fund Medicaid in the state um, or help fund Medicaid expansion in the state. Uh, so Oregon's me uh, Medicaid uh, in the state is the Oregon Health Plan. Yeah. So the Oregon Health Plan helps fund some of Oregon's most vulnerable citizens. And Measure 101 will go to help um, fund health care for one in four Oregonians. And so that's why it's really important, is that it keeps our community uh, insured and able to see a doctor um, and able to, to get that preventative care on the front end versus not having health care and then going to the emergency room because they're sick or have uh, a stack of different health issues building up. Um, and it stabilizes health, uh, health premiums for those who, or health insurance premiums for those who decide to purchase their own health insurance in the state as well. Oh. Um, but back when, going back to the Obama era, uh, under the Affordable Care Act, the uh, state ex started to expand Medicaid. And um, federal funding has been decreasing over the years um, and will continue to decrease. And so the state is needing to come up with that extra money. Um, and this is one of the, the ways that we're able to find those, those monies. And if, if Measure 101 fails, um, the state could, could see anywhere between 210 and $320 million in loss of, of state funding and up to about $5 billion in federal, in federal dollars, which really... It's matching funds. Matching something. funds, yeah. So really what that does is it blows a hole in our budget. And, and has a rippling effect in every other area throughout the state, um, which is really a concern to me, and I hope it's a concern to other folks, because um, at the end of the day, what matters is that our people have access to a doctor, and our people can see and get preventative medication and preventative care. Um, oftentimes, we are, you know, our community faces many health disparities. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a big concern for, for a lot of the, the folks in our community and the work that we do uh, at NEA. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we have an increase in diabetes, increase in alcohol and drug abuse and use. Um, high suicide rates. High rate. suicide rates, so mental health, behavioral issues. And so having, having access to those resources is so critical to our people um, in terms of that prevention. And, and that's, why, that's why I urge folks to, to turn out to vote and, and make, a, make a decision on, on a ballot, and this ballot measure. And it seems to me, or I hear, hearing reports from Indian country that it's gonna have a big impact on the Indian Health Service and tribal clinics. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how that will affect them, but I guess Lack of funding is what it'll Yeah, be, right? yeah. So an example I'll, I'll provide to you. So Virginia Garcia is, is a, a nonprofit clinic that provides Medicaid services to um, roughly 9,000 folks um, in yeah. the area. Yeah, in Oregon. And um, just, like, just like them, if Measure 101 fails, they will see a direct devastation um, to the clientele and the folks that they serve. And so... Uh, just like Indian Health Services, you know, we, you know, see folks 
the Portland urban urban native community travels, you know, they will they will have to travel far if they lose health coverage to to Grand Ron or Celets or or Warm Springs to access those Pendleton. health services. Pendleton, yeah. So so not only is there there that issue, but if if one of our, our community members loses that health coverage and then they have to drive hundreds of miles to access Indian health services, like you're you're in turn creating an environmental impact that we've worked so hard to to release you know yeah, the carbon we're fighting, footprint yeah. we're fighting that right so yeah. there's there's systemic issues as a result sure. yeah yeah well what about like i work for a nonprofit will those will they be affected by this measure yeah, so I'll I'll go back to the Virginia Garcia example. The and I, I talked to the Yes for Healthcare campaign after we spoke the other day about oh. the the health insurance premiums and things like that. Um, and there there should be no impact to to nonprofits except for those who do direct service for folks like uh, agencies like Virginia Garcia who do. Okay. Um, who work with Medicaid recipients. Um, so they yeah. would see a direct hit to the population that they serve if there is a no vote on Measure 101. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the people who are serving those marginal populations will be hardest hit. Hardest hit, yes. If it doesn't pass. Right. And so in, in the Native American Youth and Family Center where I work, um, our board of directors has chosen to endorse this measure as a priority oh. uh, because of the, the health disparities that we talked about, because we see uh -huh. a, an inherent need to continue to bridge the gap in our community between the health disparities that we always face and in healing our community from, from the, the things that we've been through. And so our hope is that folks will join us in that, in that fight uh, to, yeah. to press a, forward with a yes vote and turn okay. out to vote by Tuesday. Okay, well, let's back up a little, Will, because mm -hmm. I want to know a little more about what you do for NEA, yeah. the American yeah. Youth and Family Center. Yeah, so I serve as the Future Generations Collaborative Policy Coordinator, and so I, I love policy, oh. and, and so what the FGC, for Future Generations Collaborative, FGC for short, um, we seek to, um, educate and prevent, um, uh, really we seek to increase healthy birth outcomes in Multnomah County, which are free of substance and alcohol abuse or use. Um, and so we work a lot with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, so FASD, mm -hmm. we do a lot of education and prevention and intervention. Yeah. Um, and I work on kind of the systems change and the policy uh, and getting folks to the table and partners to the table and collaboration and things like that. So yeah. um, it's a collaborative. We work, we work, we wouldn't be able to do the work that we do if it weren't for other folks at the table um, coming together to, to increase our capacity. But um, it's an incredible, it's an incredible job. Now does NEA have like a board that oversees the director or is there an AIA board? Yeah, yeah. So our board, we do have a board of directors that oversees the executive director. Okay. Yeah. And the agency. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was probably the case. Yeah. And is it community members, local tribal community members that make up most of the board? I don't know that information actually. Oh. I know that um, I know Kay Eagle Staff is one of our board members. She's a she's a well-known community member, uh -huh. um, and there's some other folks uh, in the community that serve on our board as well. And how long have you been with Naya? I have been. I grew up as a youth going to to Naya. So ever since oh. I was a, a wow. little kid, I was 11 years old yeah. attending Naya, running through the halls. Attended, and, and now you're yeah, working for Naya. Yeah, yeah. So I grew up going to Naya, and now I serve uh, in a professional capacity at Naya. Yeah. Fun. So, do you have a degree? I do. My degree is from Oregon State. Um, and I have a, a degree in my bachelor's of science in political science with a focus in law and politics. Mm, yeah. I'm OSU class of 93. Okay, go bees. When did okay. you graduate? 2016. So just a couple a years ago. Recently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I was a beaver for good. four years and uh, got a really good education at Oregon State. I liked the campus. The mm -hmm. community had a small town feel to it. So uh, yeah, my Corvallis experience was very good. I, I would agree. I would agree. So, um, 
what uh, what didn't we cover about measure yeah. 101 that we need to talk about? Yeah, let's let's Will. look back to to measure 101 just really quick. Um, this, like I said, this is really important to to continue to help bridge the health disparities in our community by stabilizing health insurance in the state, um, and for really really for Oregon to continue to be a champion uh, for health. Uh, health equity um, and keeping folks insured and having access to health insurance and do a doctor and medication and preventative care and that's what's really important is it's gonna f it's gonna make sure that one in four Oregonians are are insured under this um, and at the end of the day I think that that you know that's why I'm voting yes is is I want a healthy community and this 1.5 percent fee on hospitals and health insurance companies there's a sunset on it, which means that it's only for two years. So it's not an indefinite thing. Mm. It's two years, so it's two thousand until 2020, which also means that the the legislature will have to come back to the drawing board to figure out next steps. Where the funding's going to yeah, come from? Yeah, but that gives them that. time to kind of draw those plans up. Yeah. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind too. That this this is not a permanent fee. This is not something that we'll see. Um, for a long time. It's only two years, 1.5% for two years. Um, and the Native American Youth and Family Center, you can drop your ballots off at NAA. Oh, um, we nice. have a ballot drop box. We'll, we will take your ballots to the elections office at the close of each day and cool. uh, for you. So we For free. For free. All yeah. right. So we eliminate the middleman. Yeah, um, good job. And, and we're a resource for you too. So if you have any questions, feel free to give me a call. Um, send me an email. I'm happy to answer any questions that w someone might have about Measure 101 or can point them in the right direction. Now, I'm not sure if we've got your email address on the scroll. Okay. I don't so think you do. So what is your email address? It's uh, William M. W I L L I A M M at NAYA, N A Y A, PDX dot org. And right. um, if you're interested in learning more about the campaign or wanting to get involved, um, folks can go to yesforhealthcare dot org. Okay. Yeah. What well, kind of impact is that going to have on elders? The same impact I think that it, it'll have on our, our entire Native community is that, you know, the lack of health services really can just. Will we'll drive our health disparities further down, and our elders need access to our health, their health services. Seems like they're always on the target on the right, block. right, and that's unfortunate. Targeting, you know, targeting our elderly, and this this is really going to protect those who are vulnerable, like our elders. And that's what I, you know, protecting our elders is something that that's critical for me to do. Right. And that's what that's why I'm fighting for Measure 101 to be passed, is because elders, children, people with disabilities. Vulnerable people in our state need access to health care and health services, and I think that this is critical in doing that. Well, and it's the right thing to do to help right. people that are less fortunate than yourselves. Right. right. I mean, that's what we're supposed to do. Right. So it's clear to me that helping the poor is always a good thing. I would agree, <laughs> yes. And if you have not received your ballot, um, folks can go to their local elections office to obtain a copy of their ballot. Um, I got mine. Well. Good, good. I hope you turn out to vote. Have you gotten yes, your ballot? Yes, I'm going to vote. Good. <laughs> and I, th I think I convinced my wife to vote yes on it. All right. So we'll get good. our ballots in together. We won't cancel each other out All right. this time. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a good thing. So, Will, I understand you have to get going, too. You I have do. to get back to Naya. Yeah. More work. Boy, you guys Gotta are really up. something. Yeah, so, wrap uh, up the day. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. And, uh, Thank you. Pleasure. We can Thank you. talk again, and uh, best of luck. I hope Measure 101 oh. passes. Tuesday. Tuesday is the deadline, 8 p.m. Okay. Um, you and now it's too late to s mail your ballots in. Also, that's another critical piece oh. of information. Yeah, you got to hand too late. deliver. You have to hand deliver. So, like I said, you can drop your ballots off at at NAA. Um, we we are happy to take those to the elections office for you, or okay. you can drop those off at a local library in Multnomah County specifically, yeah. um, or uh, uh, your elec local elections office as well. Sure. Yeah. Okay, we'll do it. All right. Thanks, Will. Thanks, David. Thank you. Now go back to work. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take your mic off first. And just give us a second here, folks, while Will gets out of here, we will move to Blanchette and 
talk about programs and projects that she's involved with. <laughs> Thank you. See you later, Will. Take it easy. Here, I'll just bounce over here right. to this. And we're showing information about uh, Measure 101 there. If you want, there's some good contact information and shows who else is supporting the uh, measure. Yes for healthcare. .org. And that's voting at the libraries and at NIA. Yes. And your local election office. So, we are down to two here at Native Nations for our January program. Blanchette Morrison of the Nez Perce Nation, thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you for inviting me. And you kind of wanted to bring your daughter to talk about the OHSU program. Yes. But she's too busy. She's got to study. Yes. So in her stead, what can you tell us about that? Um, well, briefly, you know, she, she's in a program that's recruiting, training, and retaining natives to go into health care. Great. What's the name of that program? Oh, goodness, I have it in my phone. Well, you can look it up. If I can be so casual. Because the OHSU, we had uh, some people on from the Native American Health Program. Or I can't remember what the name of that was. But OHSU has a good program for Native Americans already. Yes. And we, we really do need more uh, Native providers. Oh, yeah. One of the things, one of the struggles, and it's a personal struggle of mine, is I like to deal with natives. I like to go into the native clinic, you know, and I feel comfortable there. Not that there's anything wrong outside of there, but there's yeah. just that comfort. You oh, know. yeah. It's, it's the same with me working at Critvic, because mm -hmm. we're a native organization in the heart of Portland. So it's like a respite from the community, because you're dealing with all these other people out side and then you get into the office like ah yeah <laughs> this is nice so I really like that about my job other people I can relate to have similar background and experience some of them were lived on the res I was born on the res and lived there for all my formative years so um, having a native community in the city of Portland to go to every day is just great for me yeah, it, it definitely gives that comfort. I, I was born in Portland and lived between Portland and Lapway. Um, when I got older, I lived with my grandmother. Oh. Um, my mother passed away when I was 10, so oh. I was with my father. And, and so I made it home. Good. It, it was quite a struggle, but I made it home. And uh, I've been here for quite a while since. When I got out of college, I went back home to work for my tribe. Mm-hmm. And then I fell in love <laughs> well, with a girl from Hood River. Uh -huh. So what could I do? I had to go to Hood River. I was in love. And I've been to Hood, in Hood River ever since. But the good thing it is, it's almost halfway between Portland and the Res. So yes. I can go back and forth both ways, up and down the river. And being in Hood River, I'm within my traditional fishing zone, the Zone 6 Treaty Fishery. So I can go fishing right down there on the river, even though I'm not back on the res. I still have my treaty right to fish just right nearby. So uh, I, I like Hood River. Uh, we were actually looking at some property last summer. We were thinking of moving. Oh. And we looked at some property over in the Dells. And we also looked at some property over in Salettes. Oh. But yeah, it, it would be nice to be closer. Yeah. Um, so it's the Northwest Native American Center for Excellence. Oh. And um, I'll go ahead and read this. Yeah, go ahead and read it. It says the Northwest Native American Center of Excellence at OHSU will comprehensively and sustainably address the health care needs of all people by increasing Native American voice in the U.S. health professions workforce. Through innovative collaboration between OHSU, the Northwest Portland Indian Health Board, and Portland State University, we will meet the following objective, <laughs> objectives. Recruit, train, and retain American Indian and Alaska Native persons in the health professions. 
schools, workforce to promote and provide high quality, safe, accessible, and culturally humble health care. Train tomorrow's health professions, workforce, in minority health issues, in health equity and social determinants of health. Enhance, enhance and expand tribal academic partnerships in order to meet the research needs of tribal communities. The Northwest Native American Center of Excellence at OHSU is made possible through a five-year grant from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the OHSU School of Medicine, and the support of all 43 Pacific Northwest tribes. And I think that's another opportunity too, not only for our people to be able to serve each other, but also to be able to gain a livable wage, you know, which is, it's sad. It seems like a lot of times, you know, we're, we're overlooked for opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would love to see more Native doctors, Native nurses, and they have been, I know they've been actively recruiting Native Americans up there at OHSU, but this sounds like a real full-blown, let's round them up and bring them in. and. Yes. And get them educated. It sounds like another great opportunity, just like the one Raleigh was telling us about. And like I said, I was just on your reservation last Tuesday, and they were having a meeting there to, you know, bring in the Oregon tribes. For was it about health care regarding health care? It, it was recruiting for the students. They oh. actually didn't anticipate having the um, so many members from OHSU OHSU show up. Yeah. And when the clinic found out they brought in some of the potential students who would be oh. able to engage in that. Very so that good. was exciting to see that, you know, there's people that are, yeah. you know, wanting that. Yeah, so your daughter, she's in this ex thing, ex Pacific Northwest. <laughs> I, I can't I remember. It. It's too long of a name. Uh, Pacific Northwest Center for Excellence. Yes. And, right, and there she is. That's Dove Spector, the program coordinator. Dove Spector, mm -hmm. Tribal Engagement and Native Scholar Enrichment. Very good. But you're not you're not directly associated with this OHSU no, program. No, but, but I will be volunteering with them. Um, like I said, I'm semi-retired, so I have an awesome opportunity to volunteer my my free time. And I volunteered with Red Cross when they were they had their oh. shelter for the big fire over in the gorge. Yeah. And so I got to be there in there. Um, so your background is in healthcare? No, my background is not in healthcare. My background is in social service. Oh, okay. And clerical. Yeah. And I also did some driving. I did driving. medical transportation and um, I was doing some work over in Clackamas as well where I got to learn how to drive a big bus. All right. <laughs> well, big to be bus. Yeah, <laughs> bigger than your car. <laughs> well, do you have a degree? No. I don't. Oh. I was, um, when I was 18, I went to the Urban Indian Council, and the Urban Indian Council got me a GED. And from there, they put me into a job training program, which led me to work in for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And initially, I worked for the Bureau of Indian, Affair, Indian Affairs under the job training. Following that, they picked me up. Mm -hmm. And then I started having my children. And so at that point, I went, you know, went on the down low, stopped working. Yeah. And then I came back to work in uh, 96, and I built my background from, gosh, our, I, my portfolio from all the different varied works I had. Yeah. Yeah, I've had a lot of jobs, too. And it was fun talking to Raleigh about my journeyman experience just a little bit because I had I was 13 years with the Forest Service, had a career with them. And had I stayed with the Forest Service, I would have been able to retire eight years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still working towards my retirement, as it turns out. I uh, interrupted my career going back to school. I don't even know what would happen if I had stayed with the Bureau. That, that I probably would be doing very well. So what was before you sent retired, what was your last position that you had? My last position, I worked at the Boys and Girl, Girls Club, but that was just a part-time thing. That was oh. part of the semi-retired thing. I was having fun, um, new experience, and prior to that, I was doing uh, medical transportation, which mm -hmm. is really hard on the body. Yeah, if you're getting people in and out of a 
fan or I, it's the city the city is that's oh. hard on the body but yes i had so much fun i had so much fun with the clients mm -hmm. yes yeah and great. traveling all over one time i went down to klamath um, to do a run and oh. uh, i was dropping a patient off there or a client and so when i um, made the drop and i was trying to come back i ended up stuck i the snow was so 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 oh, bad no. <laughs> But the funniest thing is when I was in Klamath, there were kids getting off the school buses. It's ice everywhere. It's snow everywhere. And these kids, they're not Portland kids. <laughs> yeah, of course not. <laughs> yeah, we, we would be home. <laughs> well, my son has his own business mm -hmm. in non-emergency medical transportation. Mm -hmm. He went to Walla Walla and started his business. And now he's got three or four vans and two other drivers, and they take people to their appointments, you know, to the doctor and back home. That's what I was doing. To, yeah, if they need to go to, like one guy he took to Oregon for Thanksgiving dinner oh. and spent the day waiting for him to get done and then brought him back. So he, it's a lot of work at odd hours, like he had to work on Thanksgiving, for instance. Mm -hmm. But I'm really glad that Isaac, his, he's, got a career, he started his own business, and it's booming. So I'm really proud of my son for Which that. Which is another good reason to vote for that 101. Yeah. Because the, that, the Medicaid pays a lot of those. Yeah, he has a Medicaid uh, contract, mm -hmm. so the only problem he has with it is the delay, because he'll bill, and then the money comes like two months after he bills Medicaid, and so there's... But he finds private people who will pay him out of pocket to go to Baker City for the day. Mm -hmm. And so he can make really good money on some of his trips. And uh, I'm really proud of my son. So that's why I'm telling everybody about because I'm so <laughs> proud of him. So vote for your son. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, help him maintain his business by, but it's in, it's in Washington. Oh. So it's a little different situation there than in Oregon. And, but again, what I think about Measure 101 is it's a way for us to help the poor. And I think that's a real core value uh, for us, Native people, anybody. You help those that are less fortunate than yourselves because we've got the capacity, we've got the ability, we're healthy, we have money, we can afford the small fee that it takes, the small tax which I hear a lot of people, they say, it's just another tax that they're putting on the, the average person. And it's, that's one way to look at it. But I look at it as helping the poor. I don't look at it as paying more taxes. So it's clear to me what we should do. But I've heard, I listened to Lars Larson because I want to know what's going on with the, the far right wing radicals and they are dead set against 101. They do not want to see 101 pass because we've already got too many taxes. And why isn't the federal government taking care of that Medicaid? The state shouldn't have to do it. Those are some of the arguments that I've heard from the Lars Larson show. So, Well, if it's established that the federal government isn't, then somebody needs to. Yeah. Yeah, they were just complaining about the feds right. not doing it, right. and that was a reason to vote no, Right. which that didn't make any no sense, sense to me. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the money's from the federal government for all kinds of programs has been cut and reduced. And uh, like social programs have taken a lot of cuts. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be tough in the current administration because for one thing, they're not filling a lot of positions that, for staffing, for um, people that represent the country when they go out. Ambassadors. Yeah, we've, they've cut a whole bunch of ambassadors to other countries, so um, we don't have a presence really in these other countries where we were, had people where we used trying to, be welcome. to. Yeah, where we used to be welcome. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't really want to talk too much about politics unless we're talking Measure 101. <laughs>
<laughs> so you grew up in Portland, you said? Uh, yeah, well, when I turned 18, I returned here to Portland. And uh, I've been wanting to get back ever since. <laughs> but you were in Lapway for a while? Mm -hmm. Did you um, learn any of your native language while you were back home? Um, not much more than, you know, what, what was common. Yeah. Hello. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My um, girls, though, this last summer, they went there for a culture camp, and that was part of the curriculum, was learning the Nespers language. Okay. So then they were teaching me some stuff. That was nice. Great. Yeah, I was hoping they'd have a language program. Mm -hmm. We've got one on the Imatilla Res, and we just published our dictionary. Oh, nice. Yeah. So they do have a language program, a formal language program on the Nez Perce? Yeah, my grandma, um, Blanche Gould, she was one of the people that was in the interview when they established the written format. Um, a, oh. a student who came from Japan had helped um, yeah. form that. He Good. also was honored, I think just last year, uh, he was brought back to the tribe and honored by the tribe for his good work. Was that Aoki? Could you have know, been. I don't remember, remember his the name. Because uh, that's the name I'm familiar with who has done work with other tribes, not just the Nimipu, but our tribe, the Inmatillum, the Wallalupum. Mm. We're trying to bring back the original names. Like That's why I say I should say Nimipu and not Nez Perce, but it's kind of for our viewing audience. They don't really know. Right. So if we use them interchangeable, Nez Perce, Nimipu, then our viewers will get the idea. <laughs> Let's go back to our original names. And if somebody would have asked us what we called ourselves, we, it wouldn't have been Umatilla or Walla Walla or Cayuse or Nispers. So we're trying to bring back those old names and, um, and what we would have told our people, anybody who would have asked, we would have called ourselves the Natitite. Among my group, of, we were the Natitite, so. Maybe we'll get back to that name eventually someday. Yeah. So Blanchette, I was really sorry that Raleigh had to leave early because that native program sounds like the greatest opportunity for a young man looking to decide what he wants to do. One of the things Raleigh didn't mention, I don't think he did, is that um, their next classes are going to be starting up March 27th. And um, to attend that, you have to go through the orientation first. And orientations are every Monday at 1.30. And so if anybody's interested in, you know, going, entering into construction, they, um, they probably want to get to that orientation mm -hmm. Mondays, 1.30. And then March 27th will be when the classes start. And it's not limited to carpenters. Yeah. Um, the, that program, Constructing Hope, it, it avails many construction opportunities mm -hmm. and it gives you different certificates that he mentioned. Um, one of the ones he didn't mention was flagging and I know um, of some people who pick up flagging occasionally just to you know make ends meet. Well flagging pays really well. Mm -hmm. and I it, was surprised. Yeah they the constructing help also gives You'd stand a flagging there with the sign yes. all day making twenty two dollars an hour. But it's dangerous too. Oh yeah mm -hmm. and boring I'm sure. And very yeah, there dangerous. are challenges to that. Yeah. Being a flagger. Yeah, people who don't slow down. And yes, it's yes. Really I don't see how people can be so mean, you know. They they're yeah. they're working for us. Yeah. But then there will be the driver who's like, "Ah, you know, uh -huh. get out of my way." I don't care what the sign says. I need to get home. Mhm. Mm <laughs> well, flagging is they have program out of uh, Vancouver, I know. Mm -hmm. That one of my tri fellow tribal members got his um heavy equipment. It's a heavy equipment operator school is what it is mm -hmm. in uh, Vancouver. And our tribe gives scholarships to tribal members who want to attend that construction school mm -hmm. over in Vancouver. So uh, Clifford Shippentower took the class during a bad fishing year. He's a fisherman mm -hmm. and does well when the runs are good. He makes a lot of money. But of course, if there's no run like this last year, he had could fall back on his construction, so he brought bought a backhoe after he got through the school, and when it's slow fishing, he can fall back on the training he got from the tribe to be an equipment operator, and uh, that's another option 
that people who are members of the Umatilla tribe would have to, because we fund our tribal members through that construction school. And well, I'm if your we, tribe wants to do a cheaper way, they could send them to Constructing Hope. <laughs> yeah, really, that is better deal. Yeah, if, even though they don't have any incentive, financial incentive to attend their program, one of the things that is mandatory is work source. Everybody has to sign up for that. And through work source, they also look to see if there's any opportunities, you know, f like if you can get, you know, assistance with food, assistance with child care. So th these are things that work source will oh, um, navigate for you. Yeah, because just having the tuition waiver, you still need to survive, have to have food right. to eat and a roof over your head. And so there are other complications, which everybody has to deal with on a daily basis. But... I really am glad we had Raleigh here and talk about that program because because you don't really need like the OHSU seems like it'd be more demanding as far as you know intellectually more demanding and the carpentry is more physically demanding but uh, still they're both great programs and we're recruiting native students and Thanks for bringing it to us tonight, Blanche. And the nice thing too is, while you're when, once you're into the trades, you're able to gain, you know, your income and the, mm -hmm. th that livable wage. Yeah. Which I think to our people is not, you know, readily available. No. No, we've been in the lower spectrum of income for years and trying to catch up. So, programs like this will really help the native community. Yeah, and they said that they average about four natives per um, group, and their groups are approximately 25 in size, uh -huh. and so they, they, they're glad to have them. Good. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Blanchette. We have uh, 30 seconds left in our show, so I want to thank Metro East and Jim and Karma back behind the window. Good job, you guys. We got through another show here in January, and... This program will be archived in the Metro East Community Media webpage if you didn't catch it all and you can watch it later.